started with today's webinar. Welcome. My name is Sharon Rich. I'm the Senior Trust Advisor with AGID, Advocates and Guardians for the Elderly and Disabled. Thank you for joining us today for our monthly webinar. Uh, I wanted, we have two guest speakers with us today, which I will introduce in just a few moments. Very excited to have them with us today. Everybody will get a certificate of attendance after today's meeting. And the um, webinar is certified for continuing ed for guardians and attorneys. And we will be sharing the presentation uh, power or a, a PowerPoint with you after the presentation. Give Kate about a week to get everything mailed out. And then, of course, you will also be able to have viewing capabilities afterwards for that. Uh, we have a pretty good crowd today. So we would ask everybody to please put your questions into chat and we will save time at the end to go through those with you. As most of you know, AGID, here we manage special needs trust for seniors and persons with disabilities. And we're all about helping people to get on government benefits. So sometimes our clients do get um, uh, injury settlements. And um, so we have to use a special, sometimes this topic that we're gonna talk about today is something that we do here at AGIT and segregate our funds within a special needs trust. Um, the topic today is Medicare set aside trust. We have Craig Pauly as our speaker from Medivest and Fran Canis from Medivest. They both have quite a bit of experience. Um, Craig is a business development um, uh, senior uh, vice president for Medivest and Fran is their sales director. I've known Medivest for many years as actually when I was a trust officer 10 years ago, Medivest was big in the industry in this. So they have been around a lot, long time and have a lot of expertise. So I'm gonna turn it over to Fran to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for, for everybody being here today. So. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I, I am Fran Canas. I'm the Director of Sales for Florida, Texas, and New Mexico. And we also have Craig Pauly here, the VP of Business Development. And today we're going to talk about settling cases with a Medicare component. So let's get started. Okay, so who we are and why we're here. Medivest was founded in 1996, and we've been in business for over 25 years. So as Sharon said, we've been around for a very long time. Our average employee tenure is, is, is of over eight years. So we've seen a lot of complicated cases, and we've been able to find creative solutions for those cases. So that helps a lot when handling cases for your clients. We've had the same owners since inception, so there's no venture capital or outside investment. And that is very important because it allows us to make our, our decisions and um, we've had the same owners. And lastly, we've, we've, um, we offer pre and post settlement solutions, which we'll go, go over on the next slide. So here is a list of our products and services. What we do, um, we handle, we, do, we offer professional administration. And what we do is that when the MSA funds and uh, customized custodial accounts are administered. Those are managed by a professional per CMS guidelines. We also offer Medicare set-asides, the famous MSAs, and those are allocation reports that project future medicals, specifically the Medicare-covered case-related items over the life expectancy of the injured, and these reports are prepared by our registered nurses. We also offer a lien resolution, and you can see there we can handle any type of liens if you ever need help with any of that. We also offer medical cost rejections, or also known as MCPs. These are very similar to the MSAs, so projection reports, but these offer the full spectrum of the medicals, not just the Medicare covered items. And we also offer trust advisor services. So if you do have a client that is dual eligible, if they are on Medicare, and Medicaid, 
um, and there's a special needs trust involved and, and there's an MSA, what happens is that those MSA funds can be counted as assets and that could potentially kick off the, the um, uh, beneficiary of their benefit, Medicaid benefits, Medicare benefits. So uh, we coordinate with, with the s &T to make sure everything is handled properly and so they don't lose their benefits. So I'm gonna kick it over to Craig now. All right, thank you, Fran. Yeah, I promised that was the that was the brief commercial for us and kind of why we're here. So you know how we can help you um, and, and, and what we do. Um, so thank you, Fran. Uh, my name is Craig Pauly. I'm the I'm the SVP of business development. Uh, I've been working in the Medicare compliance field for close to 17 years. Uh, seen a lot of complicated cases. I've been involved with close to about 7000 MSAs to date. Uh, those were all handled by me. So I've seen a lot of tricky cases, both in work comp and liability. Um, and I always tell people, you know, Fran and I uh, can help you out uh, with, with questions that you have. We've seen a lot of complicated cases, so uh, we can offer solutions. And, and every once in a while, we get, we get stumped. We do get stumped because something new has popped up we've never heard before. So, uh, but we have a lot of resources to go to with our office. Uh, you know, like I said, we have a long employee tenure. Uh, we've seen a lot of cases. Uh, so we can kind of go back and we have a pool of resources to kind of address those. So... Um, all right, let's get into the really fun stuff, uh, settling cases with a Medicare component. Uh, we're going to talk about the MSP statute and where this really comes from. But as you're looking at a case or you're going through a case, um, or, or uh, as you're looking at this stuff, these are the things you really want to consider. Uh, what kind of benefits uh, is the injured worker or inj injured individual receiving? You know, are they receiving Medicare benefits? Have they applied for Social Security disability? Uh, are they receiving uh, Medicaid benefits? Uh, those, you, you want to identify what kind of benefits the individual is on so you can start making plans on how to protect those benefits. I tell people a lot of what we do is making sure that um, much like an s and works to help protect Medicaid benefits, uh, what we do helps to protect Medicare benefits long term. Uh, so you want to find out what the individual is receiving and that helps you kind of get together a game plan uh, on how to proceed. Uh, has Medicare paid for any treatment related to your case? This is typically in reference to the Medicare liens. Um, there's some mechanisms in place that allow them to find out about these cases um, automatically via a reporting process, which we'll talk about. So if you know this is an issue, um, if somebody's on Medicare, uh, chances are um, CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is aware of that because of a reporting process we'll talk about in a few minutes. So... Um, they're aware of these cases, you know, but prior to that reporting being in place, uh, you know, it was really on the attorney and the, the parties to notify Medicare. Now they've made that mandatory. So uh, I like to say there's no flying under the radar anymore. Uh, there was a period of time where um, even with the MSP statute on the books, that's the Medicare secondary payer statute, um, people weren't paying attention to it. And Medicare wasn't really doing much to enforce anything related to it. Uh, that's completely changed. Um, as you're looking at another thing to consider, what does future medical care look like? You know, does that individual need a lot of medical care? Um, have they treated and are they now back to a completely stable condition and need no further treatment or medications? That's going to affect um, your plans for moving forward. How do you, how do you address that uh, in terms of the MSP statute? So you want to know what future medical care looks like on the case or have an idea. Um, is the individual prepared to manage? their future medical care funds. Uh, the vast majority of people that we work with um, don't have experience doing that or not comfortable doing it. Um, and in a lot of instances, I think when it comes to MSA funds, about 80% of the people who have an MSA set up that administer the funds themselves mess it up in the first five years. You know, and that's a problem that does jeopardize Medicare benefits down the road. Uh, so it's, a, it's important to uh, know if your client is prepared to manage those funds. And if they, if they are, um, there's some guidelines we'll talk about later, and we actually have documentation that you can share with those individuals so that if they decide to manage themselves, they're fully aware of what they have to do to stay in compliance with the MSP statute. Um, and again, the last thing, are you protecting uh, the individual's future Medicare benefits? You know, when you're dealing with uh, Medicare compliance, uh, that's really what we do. We make sure that those benefits are there um, no matter what happens uh, down the road as long as things are handled properly. Our job is to educate people on that and assist them with doing that uh, if they so desire. So 
Uh, now we're going to talk about the Medicare secondary payer statute. This is the whole reason we're here today talking to everybody about this, uh, whether it's liens, whether it's MSAs, this all goes back to the Medicare secondary payer statute in 1980. So in 1980, Congress enacted the Medicare secondary payer statute, giving Medicare rights as a secondary payer. The MSP and its regulations prohibit Medicare from making a payment when there's a primary payer involved. So this is essentially, I put it down there at the bottom, no double dipping. Uh, what was happening is uh, prior to Medicare really enforcing anything related to the MSP statute, uh, you could have somebody who settles a workers' compensation case and receives money for future medical. If that individual is on Medicare benefits and they receive money in their settlement for future medical, uh, what a lot of those individuals were doing was they would put all the money in their pocket, spend it however they wanted, and then they would put their Medicare card down for treatment. Uh, when they put that card down for treatment, uh, Medicare ended up picking up the tab for something they've actually been paid for via uh, that worker's compensation settlement or if it was a liability case, if there was future, future medical funds allocated as part of the settlement. Um, so that everybody was really shifting the burden to Medicare. And I mean, we all pay into that system. You know, you have the Medicare trust fund um, and they realize this is an area where they shouldn't be um, spending money because there's a statute in place. So that's where this really came from. Uh, they did a couple studies and found out they were spending a lot of money that they shouldn't be spending. And then they started uh, looking into things and decided to actively enforce the statute. So when it says that there's a primary payer involved, so these are the five types of plans that are deemed primary to Medicare benefits. It's workers' compensation, liability insurance, no-fault insurance, self-insured plans, and automobile insurance. Uh, you hear, if, you, if you've uh, heard some things in the past about set-asides, uh, Medicare set-asides, most of the time it's, you hear about it in the sense of a workers' compensation case. Uh, I do a lot of CLE presentations educating the, uh, the liability space, uh, liability attorneys um, on the, the Medicare secondary payer statute and MSAs because uh, the obligation to comply with the statute actually applies to liability. So on the liability side of things, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of issues that haven't been addressed. Whereas in workers' compensation, you have a lot of guidelines um, that have been put out by Medicare on how to handle it. Uh, so in liability, uh, those got, we're still waiting on guidelines. We've been waiting five, six years for those guidelines, and they keep kicking the can down the road. They were supposed to put them out last year, then they bumped it, and they're supposed to come out this year, and they bumped it again. Uh, my own personal thoughts is they don't fully understand the liability space, and they need to address all these crazy circumstances you encounter in liability where maybe you have contributory negligence, uh, you know, maybe there's policy limits. Um, so I think Medicare is still trying to understand that space, which is part of the reason why they haven't issued guidelines in the liability arena like they have for workers' compensation. So I think it's important to, uh, for everybody to take away from this that uh, even though there's a lack of guidance over there, um, liability is still a primary plan uh, to Medicare, and you do want to at least address that issue to cover the statute. So um, uh, the big takeaway from this is whether it's work comp liability, no fault auto, self-insurance plans, this all falls under the MSP statute and uh, any settlements resulting from those cases for and if there's future medical component need to be spent prior to Medicare picking up the bill. So complying with the MSP statute is mandatory um, regarding past and future medicals and is not limited to work comp claims. So it's important to remember there's two pieces of compliance with the MSP statute. One is the past payments, which is typically your Medicare liens, and then future medicals, which is where you get into, you know, potentially this Medicare set aside issue and setting aside funds for the future medical care that's going to be needed. Uh, so uh, on May 25th, 2011, the stall cup memo was issued by CMS. Uh, that's CMS's way of putting out guidelines. These aren't actually laws. They're guidelines on how they're handling and how they view these cases. Um, so that, that becomes a questionable point sometimes with attorneys. They're like, well, it's not a law. I don't have to do this. What you do have to do is comply with the statute and consider Medicare's interest. The guidance is the best way to do that. So when this stall cup memo was issued in 2011, 
Um, it says the law requires that Medicare trust funds must be protected from payment for future services, whether it's work comp or liability. There's no distinction in the law. That's the closest they've come to saying, hey, you need to do something in liability too. Uh, they are very cautious about how they word things. Uh, that was from a town hall memo. Um, even though there's no formal review process in the liability arena like there is for workers' compensation, CMS does expect funds to be exhausted on Medicare covered and otherwise reimbursable services related to what was claimed or released before Medicare is billed. So they're expecting funds from the settlement to be used to pay for medical um, and, and, and be exhausted before Medicare will step in and start covering things again. And, you know, with this groundwork of how everything's put together with, um, you know, the only law is complying with the MSP statute. You have to consider Medicare's interest um, and they're a secondary payer. So each, each individual is going to have to determine based on the specific facts of the case whether or not there's funding for future medical, and if so, a need to protect the trust fund. And that's the Medicare trust fund. So I touched on this a little bit already. Um, why is Medicare interested in my settlement? Medicare wants to make sure that it is not paying for items where there's a primary payer involved. Uh, CMS wants to make sure that the settling parties are not shifting the burden to Medicare. Uh, Medicare's primary enforcement mechanism for this, for not complying with the statute, um, ends up being carried out in a post-settlement environment where uh, they basically deny payments. That is their way of enforcing this. That's their primary mechanism. Somebody goes to the doctor, puts down a card for Medicare treatment if they believe it's related to the case, and we'll talk about how they find out about that in a few slides. Um, but if they believe it's related to the case, they have a marker in their system and they just deny payment for the bill. And that's a problem for the individual if they don't have money set aside to cover uh, that treatment, if it's related to the case. And then also Medicare wants to make sure that if it is paid for anything that is covered by a primary plan, uh, that it's reimbursed of those funds. This is typically, typically your Medicare lien. Uh, they've gotten pretty serious about this uh, over the past couple of years. Um, they, they've been pretty serious about it for a while, but they've done some additional things recently that can have an impact for the individual in that post-settlement environment. So if there's a lien out, the Medicare lien out there, and that lien, once a final demand has been issued, if that lien isn't paid within the specified period of time, uh, it will be referred to the Department of Treasury. Uh, we do uh, work on liens. Uh, when those liens are sent to the Department of Treasury, they're extremely difficult to get pulled out of there. And when they are at the Department of Treasury, they are also accruing penalties and interest. So uh, once things go to the DOT, um, you know, you kind of have limited options on how to handle them. In some instances, we've recommended paying it to stop the interest and penalties from accruing. And then we have to work backwards after that. Um, from our experience, it's very difficult to get it pulled out of the DOT typically. Um, if it was sent there in error, we can get it out of there, or if they made a mistake in the information they communicated. Um, other than that, it's pretty difficult. So they are very serious about this. Uh, one of the scary things that they've been doing over the past probably two years is if you have an individual who has an outstanding Medicare lien that's at the Department of Treasury and it's not being paid back, we have seen instances where they will start to garnish a portion of Social Security disability payments if they're receiving them. Uh, they won't take the whole thing, but they'll take a piece of it and they will continue to do that until that lien is paid back. So it's always important to address liens uh, when you know uh, when you find out about them and, uh, you know, in a in a what's the right word in a timely fashion. <laughs> there you go. Um, so that's why Medicare is interested in the settlement. They want to make sure their future interests are protected. The burden's not being shifted and they want to make sure if they paid for anything that they're reimbursed for it. So this is a big one. How will Medicare find out about the settlement? So if you have an individual who is a Medicare beneficiary, uh, this went into effect July 1st, 2009, uh, the MMSEA, which stands for the Medicare and Medicaid S-CHIP Extension Act, requires that applicable plans, that's those five plans we talked about earlier, they must first determine whether an individual um, whose claim is unresolved is entitled to Medicare benefits. The primary payer, that's typically the insurance carrier, the source of funds, must then report the required information once the case is resolved to the department or the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services 
in the form, manner, and frequency, their wording, <laughs> the secretary prescribes. Um, CMS is a regulatory body under Health and Human Services. So that required information, uh, just so everyone's aware, is over 200 data fields. It's everything from all the parties associated with the case, um, ICD-9, ICD-10 codes, they wanna know about the injuries, they wanna know who the insurance carriers are. Um, and then uh, they're very serious about this. So when this was initially rolled out, they freaked everybody out. It took them about four years to get the system in place, but they told everybody about it before they had the system in place. You know, it was cart before the horse situation. Uh, so what they said, which really scared everybody when this was rolled out, says if this information is not provided to Medicare in the form, manner, and frequency requested, Medicare may impose a fine of up to $1,000 per day per claimant as civil monetary penalties. Um, so as of today, I'm not aware of anybody being fined yet, but they are on the verge. I think they might actually increase that penalty, and they're on the verge of actually starting to enforce that now. Uh, so again, I don't want to freak anybody out here on this call. This information is provided to them by the primary payer. It's typically the insurance carrier. They're the ones that this applies to. Uh, for everybody on this, this webinar today, uh, the takeaway is Medicare is going to be aware about this case if my client is on Medicare. So you want to make sure you address both the past and future medical components of the case. Uh, the public comment period closed at the end of April 2020 on CMS proposed rulemaking for regulations that would implement the MSP's civil monetary provisions. So these regulations are expected to be released soon. Uh, you can see they've been, uh, since April 2020, they've been talking about it. They still haven't put that out yet. So it is not a fast moving process. I just want everybody to be aware of it. So this is how Medicare will find out about a case. So if that individual is on Medicare, the primary payer has to report that information to CMS and CMS places a marker in their system. So when those ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes come across, if one of them is for a back injury or, or back surgery, uh, you know, something along those lines, um, there's a marker placed in the Medicare system. So if they ever get a bill for something related to that, they know they are not primary and they shouldn't pay it. So they deny payment for it. And that's where you want to make sure you have funds set aside to take care of it. Um, so addressing past medicals on a case, this is the Medicare lien. We talked about this a little bit already. Uh, does the individual have a Medicare lien? So if you have somebody who's not on Medicare, there's no chance that they're going to be racking up a Medicare bill. So that's pretty clear cut. If they are on Medicare, one of the questions you want to ask is, does this individual have a Medicare lien? Um, uh, once entitlement has been verified, so if that individual is on Medicare, you want to initiate a Medicare lien investigation on the case. Uh, once a settlement has been reached, you want to request an updated Medicare lien. The reason being, you might check a file, um, you know, at a, a certain period of time and it comes back and there's nothing on it. Well, if settlement discussions go on for months and months and months and there's some treatment involved in the middle um, and it's six months later, you want to go back and you want to request an updated Medicare lien. You want to check again to see if anything has gone on there since the last time. You want to do that within a reasonable amount of time of settlement so that I'll give you a picture of, of what things look like close to settlement. And then uh, if CMS does have a lien and they issue a final demand, it must be paid within 60 days to avoid penalties and interest. Uh, once that starts happening, if you don't pay it, that's when it heads off to the Department of Treasury and then it sits there until, uh, for the most part, until it gets paid. And it continues to rack up penalties and interest. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Fran. Uh, she's going to talk to you a little bit about, so that's that's past medicals uh, and the MSP statute. Fran's going to talk about future medicals, she's talking about identifying cases uh, that potentially could use a Medicare set aside to protect Medicare's interest on the case. Thank you, Craig. Yes, Craig. So we talked about past medicals, liens, and now we're going to talk about future medicals, which usually would be the MSA. So the most frequent question that I get when people call me up is, Fran, should my client get an MSA? Do they need an MSA? Um, when should you consider an MSA allocation for my client? So here is a quick list of some qualifiers for you to know when it would make sense for your client to get an MSA done. So the first one would be if your client is currently a Medicare beneficiary, they should consider getting an MSA allocation 
or if the claimant has applied for SSDI or is in the process of, of applying for SSDI, or if the claimant has, the, has applied for SSDI and has been denied and anticipates reapplying. And the reason why is, uh, you know, why uh, that is also important is because if they have an open or pending application for disability, they are also considered as a, as a potential beneficiary for Medicare. Uh, another qualifier would be if the claimant is over 62 and a half years of age and is Medicare eligible and uh, the monetary, monetary value of the case that is mostly for work comp cases. So any of those um, qualifiers would be uh, important for you to, to know and, and to see if you should consider an MSA allocation. And Fran, one thing I wanted to add to that too is when we're talking about social security disability benefits, um, when it, that is one of the ways you can get Medicare benefits prior to age 65. So every, you know, a lot of people will think, hey, Medicare is a retire, you know, 65 years old, they're not over 65, I don't need to worry about this. Um, applying for disability benefits is one of the ways you can get Medicare benefits prior to age 65. So I've had 25 year old individuals who've worked enough quarters who've applied for disability got accepted, and they got Medicare benefits early so they might be 25 26 years old and receiving Medicare. So you don't want to immediately write it off if somebody's not 65 years old. And that's why you want to find out what kind of benefits they're getting. And then on the monetary value of the case, traditionally, the higher the value of the case um, that's out there, uh, the more likely it is there's a catastrophic injury involved. And it's a lot more likely that individual has not gone back to work uh, or potentially has um, issues regarding um, income. So applying for disability is one of the ways that you can kind of help offset that. So if you know somebody's not working um, and they have a, a catastrophic injury, it's highly likely that they've applied for disability benefits at some point. So that's something you want to look into. Uh, I just wanted to add those two because those kind of it, it, it goes down the uh, the rabbit hole a little bit. So I won't go any further, but um, all right. Thank you, Craig. Um, and this is a flow chart, just a quick flow chart. And it shows what we were just talking about on the prior slide. So. I am more of a visual person, so I think this is very helpful. If you want to see if an MSA allocation is recommended for your client, I just look at this. So you would look at the first question, does the settlement close future medical payments? So um, if it's yes, then you would go on, onto the left side and see um, if, the, if, the, if any of the following are true. So those are the qualifiers. And you can just take a look at this and we can send this to you so you can keep it handy um, and see if your client may need an MSA. So. Um, so what is needed to complete an MSA allocation? So let's say now you, you say, okay, Fran and Craig, we do need to, to do an MSA for this client. What do we need to get it done? We would need first a completed referral form. We, we have a referral form that we could provide to you. It just has demographics from the, from the client. Um, most recent two years of medical re reports, the last two years of prescription invoices, and that is not mandatory. If you have them available, that would be great. And lastly, payment ledger showing individual TD, PD, and medical payment, and that is only for work comp cases. So if you have a, a case uh, that it's liability, don't worry about that. Yeah, and, and on the, the medical records, when these reports are put together, CMS guidelines or guidance that they've issued through their memos and their work comp reference guide, uh, whenever they look at a case, um, they're looking at the most recent two years of narrative medical records. So when our nurses review those records, they are picking out the Medicare covered case related items that are being recommended from the most recent two years of narrative medical records. So when we're looking at a case, we're not looking and CMS is not looking at records that are eight, nine, 10 years old. They wanna look at the most recent two years of narrative medical records on the case. Okay. So here we have a, a sample for Ms. Jane's sample of an MSA report. This is just the first page, it's the summary. And right here you see the demographics of Ms. Jane's sample. Right in the middle, you would see her life expectancy. So as you may know, the MSA reports are um, allocated for their life expectancy. So you see there, she would live for 17 more years. And then underneath, you would see her future medical treatment amount and the future prescription amount. So if you add those up, that would be the total MSA amount, which I think it's one hundred and almost thirty three thousand. Um, and then once you have completed the MSA report, you could fund the MSA 
as a lump sum or with an annuity. So right there underneath, you can see the seed amount and the, and the annuity, the annual payment. Um, I, I don't know if you want to add anything else, Greg? Uh, yeah, uh, real quick on the, um, uh, you know, as far as, as the report goes, there will be a detailed breakdown on the last page. Uh, it's typically two pages and it breaks down each individual item that's Medicare covered. Um, it's important to remember, this is only the Medicare covered case related items. So, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, if somebody's looking to try and get a case value and maybe they're not going the route of doing a life care plan, that medical cost projection will not only give you the Medicare covered items, but it will give you the non-Medicare covered items as well. As well. That report is a little bit cheaper than our MSA report, but it's not split apart. Um, and as far as the pricing uh, that's used for these Medicare set-asides, it depends on the case. Uh, if it's a workers' compensation case and we're doing a set-aside on it, it's based upon the state fee schedule. Uh, if we are putting together a Medicare set-aside on a liability claim, um, it's based on usual and customary pricing, which is the fancy way of saying full retail, uh, and the zip code where the accident happened. Now, I don't want to go too far down this road, but one of the things with liability set-asides is you have some unusual factors that come into play in the case. You may have contributory negligence. You may have, um, uh, you may have policy limits. So, right, what if you have an MSA that comes back at $100,000, but you got a $50,000 policy limit and the person's on Medicare? You have to be able to account for that. So we have a process that's based on... Um, um, some court rulings relating to uh, Medicaid liens um, that CMS has accepted. So we have a very similar formula for what we refer to as apportioning the liability set aside. So that allows you to take into account those factors, um, you know, because as an, as an attorney, there's attorney's fees that will come out of the settlement. You might have some liens that need to be paid back. So the net to the individual may end up being less than the set aside. So through a process of apportionment, we will draft an apportionment letter based on the facts and factors of the case that will recommend a different lower amount based upon those factors. So you're still covering the statute, even though you're not setting aside the full Medicare set aside amount. So that's a reasonable thing to do. Um, and that's based on uh, some court cases where they ruled in favor of apportionment. It's a conservative method. We use a conservative method. There's a couple of folks that use uh, non-conservative methods and really whittle those down to the point where, you know, you potentially leave in some exposure. So um, again, uh, as far as guidance from CMS, um, it would, I would love, love guidance. It would make my life a little bit easier, but I'm also a little scared to see what they would do because there's been situations where they don't address these certain instances. So um, I'd love to see some more guidelines in the liability space, but I'm also a little scared to know what that would look like and what, what kind of chaos it might cause for everyone. Um, so. Perfect. Thank you, um, Greg. Yeah. Um, all right. Just keeping an eye on time and we will get to the questions in chat. Uh, I forgot to mention that, uh, as soon as the presentation, we get to then we got a, some time for Q and A. So I don't want anybody to think we're ignoring, uh, ignoring them. Um, so let's say you, and here's the other thing I want to add too. Um, there are some instances where if you have a case where somebody is on Medicare, but the medical reports say they're fine, they don't need any future treatment, they're not taking any medications, um, let us know. We have some language you can drop into the settlement paperwork that says, hey, even though this person's on Medicare, they don't need future medical treatment, the records indicate they're fine, they're back to normal. Um, we have some language you can drop in settlement paperwork. Uh, just to address Medicare. And in that situation, you're not going to set any money aside because there's nothing to set aside for. Uh, Medicare views these cases as a snapshot in time. So what's going on on the case when it settles? So if we prepare a Medicare set aside and you set aside from that last slide, I think it was 132,000, um, you know, case settles, that individual has their MSA fund set up, they're using their funds. Um, let's say that individual has a really bad year and just absolutely, maybe they go get a massive back surgery and they blow through those MSA funds. They're completely exhausted and they've all been spent per Medicare's guidelines, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, if they've all been spent correctly, then Medicare will step in and become the primary payer again for those Medicare covered case related items. They understand that nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody can see into the future. They don't expect you to try and guess what's going to happen with this person. There's a reasonable expectation on medical conditions on what they would need. And that's what CMS is really looking at. 
Um, so if you have somebody who settles a case now and they need minimal stuff and post settlement, their condition turns a lot worse. Um, as long as the MSA funds have been sp spent correctly, Medicare will step in. And that's really where the MSA helps to protect those future medical benefits, future Medicare covered benefits. So, all right, so we figured out what the MSA amount is. Um, on that case, it's 132,000. The question I always get is what happens to those MSA funds? That number, what, what's going on with that? So there's two options as far as what can happen with the MSA funds. The first option is it can be set up in a custodial account. It's also called professional administration. And that's where a company is hired to handle uh, the individual's MSA funds per CMS's guidelines. They assume full responsibility for them. They handle all bill paying with the providers. They handle any reporting that needs to be done to Medicare. Uh, typically, a professional administrator is going to negotiate with those providers. Um, and one of the things to keep in mind, if, if your, your client goes into, um, goes into a provider and says, hey, um, the bill needs to come to me. I have a Medicare set-aside account. Uh, you got to remember any prearranged insurance rates through like their private insurance, that's all gone. So traditionally, what ends up happening is that individual is going to get a bill for the full amount or possibly even more because it's not related to any sort of insurance. Um, so if a professional administrator is involved, um, for us, we have access to pricing for every zip code throughout the country for all these procedures. So we know what the average price is in that area and we know what we can negotiate them down to. Um, so what happens is if a professional administrator is involved, they're gonna do all this for the individual. It's very hands-off. They can just focus on going to the provider, getting the treatment they need, uh, they would get a card with our information they provide to the treaters, and those treaters will reach out to the administrator, and the administrator will coordinate everything for them. Um, so it's very hands-off for them. Um, and just, just to give you an idea, um, you know, the, the next question I always get about professional administration is, well, what's the cost? Um, if Medivest is holding the MSA funds, uh, it's traditionally a one-time fee of $950. Um, so... Um, that's most of the cases we handle are done in that fashion where we're actually holding the MSA funds in an account for that individual, we're paying bills, we're managing it. Uh, so this is not something that's going to cost you thousands and thousands of dollars to have done. And uh, that 950 that uh, for those cases uh, that are 950, um, that is for the life of the account. So if it sticks around for six months before it's exhausted, or if it's around for 25 years, we have some individuals right now who've been with us since the very beginning. And we're still administering funds for them and paying bills. Um, so that is the professional administration side of things. Uh, the second option, and this is a much riskier option, uh, is self-administration. And that's where an individual manages their own MSA funds per CMS's guidelines. Like I said, 80% of people mess it up in the first five years when they self-administer their funds. Um, I've worked on a lot of cases where uh, the individual is adamant that they want to do it themselves. They're not interested in professional administration. Uh, if you encounter a situation like that, what you really want to do is you want to make sure that they are aware of the obligations for those MSA funds. So Fran and I have a document. It's called the Terms and Conditions for Self-Administration. And there's a nice little spot for the individual to sign on it. So if they are adamant they want to administer their own MSA funds, you want to present this document to them so they're aware of what they need to do and have them sign it um, so that if there is an issue down the road, they can't come back uh, to you or to their attorney and say, we never covered this, I wasn't aware, now Medicare is denying payments and I don't have any money to pay for treatment. Um, so uh, it's important to remember, even if you're acting in good faith, if you're self-administering your MSA funds, um, you have some people that will go and buy a house, a boat, a car with their MSA funds. I've seen it. Uh, we had one individual whose, mo whose mother was in her 80s. He was acting on her behalf. Um, there was an MSA fund set up there. This was, this was a rare instance. I haven't seen this too often, but uh, the son said, well, you know, I'm going to open a pizza shop and I'm going to run this pizza shop. I'm going to make so much money I can pay all my mom's medical bills. And the adjuster who was handling that file actually refused to let them self-administer the funds because... She asked some basic questions. She said, have you ever run a restaurant before? No. Have you ever run a pizza place? No. Um, what experience do you have in this field? And it was none. I'm just going to make pizza and it's going to pay my mom's bills. So that's, a, that's a, obviously a, a situation where it's pretty clear cut. 
uh, you move to the other side of things and you have someone who's self-administering and let's say they overpay for their medication. Uh, if the medication, if CMS says, hey, this should be no more than $10, they pay 15. Medicare audits that file. They have to put back that $5 they spent incorrectly and, and spend it correctly and prove they spent it correctly. So they don't take it easier on um, individuals, uh, even if they're acting in good faith. There's just the guidelines that you got to follow. Um, as far as the rules uh, for self-administration versus professional administration, um, they're exactly the same. They don't uh, go easier on somebody who self-administers their MSA funds. Again, at the end of the day, they want to make sure the Medicare trust fund is being protected and that uh, the burden is not being shifted to them. So I keep talking about CMS requirements for the MSA funds. Um, the MSA funds must be placed in an interest-bearing account uh, separate from other funds. Um, if there's a professional administrator involved, they must forward annual accounting statements to CMS. Uh, the MSA fund should only be used for Medicare-covered case-related items. Uh, one of the things I want to point out about this is if an individual is self-administering their MSA funds, um, they're going, in some instances, they're going to have to decide if something is part of their case or not. Because if you, uh, what's interesting, the MSA, like I said, is a snapshot in time, but I like to use the, the instance of, let's say you have somebody who has an elbow injury as part of their case. And over time, they settle their case, there's treatment allocated for the elbow. Now, let's say because that elbow has deteriorated or causing problems, that individual is now having range of motion issues in their shoulder. So if you can draw a connection between that elbow injury and what's happening in the shoulder, you can actually use the MSA funds to pay for it. If CMS audits the file and disagrees with it, they would expect whatever was paid for the shoulder to be uh, put back. One of the nice things about administration um, is instead of the individual making that determination, we can look at it and make that determination. If we determine that shoulder is related, we pay it. If Medicare ever audits the file and says, you shouldn't have paid that, those, MS those funds in a worst case scenario, um, Medivest would replace them out of our own pocket, not the individual. So that's another benefit to professional administration. So there's gonna be some judgment calls in there too. And I tell people, you know, we've been doing this for over 25 years. Uh, we got a pretty good feel for when we can pay for something that might not have been in the allocation, but there's a, you can draw a connection to it. So those are the decisions that are going to have to be made by the individual um, if it's not professionally administered. Uh, an individual may self-administer his or her own MSA funds, but the rules and regulations are all the same. Um, if you self-administer, you also have to provide self-attestation letter uh, uh, to, uh, to Medicare, uh, on the case and then administration fees and attorney's fees. So if you hire a professional administrator, that's the administration fees that 950 I was referencing and attorney's fees cannot be charged to the MSA account. That's a question that we get. Um, you, you can't take either of those out of the actual MSA account. Now I've talked about this a little bit already, so I'll keep this one brief. Um, the benefits of professional administration, um, there's claims repricing. That's basically where uh, we work with the providers uh, to negotiate um, down the cost of services. Uh, uh, sometimes we can get them to accept Medicare rates by bringing in information about, hey, this is a Medicare set-aside account. Uh, um, as, as we are handling the funds, when we have direct access to them, we have the account set up for benefit of that individual, um, we can negotiate with the providers and we have a lot of um, we have a lot of leverage uh, when we talk to them. In some instances, we can say, hey, look, you know, if you guys will accept this, we'll cut you a check in three days. And they're going, wait, I don't have to wait three months through insurance to get paid. Yeah, we'll wheel and deal on this. The nice thing is if we negotiate with those providers and save uh, save money for that individual, we don't take a percentage of savings. That money stays, that money we save stays in the MSA account and actually stretches it out and makes it last longer for that individual, which is a great thing. Uh, the other thing uh, an administrator will do is coordinate benefits across multiple insurance plans. So if you have somebody who's on Medicare um, and they also have private insurance, uh, we establish, if we set up an administration account, uh, we collect information on their health insurance and we establish that hierarchy. So if somebody goes into the provider 
and they're being seen for something that's related to their case and something that's not, we will work with the provider to let them know, hey, these bill, the bills for these items should come to us. Uh, the bills for these other items are not part of this MSA account. Those should go to X, Y, or Z. So we will actually coordinate benefits for that individual. That's another thing they're not going to have to do with their provider. Uh, an administrator also will provide access to discount pharmacy and medical equipment and uh, uh, supply vendors. So if you have an individual whose account is being administered uh, with us, they will also have access, say that person needs a specialized, maybe they want a specialized wheelchair, even if it's not part of their uh, Medicare set aside account. Um, they can reach out to us. We have this network we can go to. And if they say, hey, I can get this wheelchair, I'm being quoted 1200 bucks, what can you guys do? If we can get that uh, drastically cheaper, they have access to that. And that's just an added benefit of being a, a member of Medivest for professional administration. Uh, like I said, we'll negotiate with the providers to reduce uh, procedure costs. Uh, we act as a CMS liaison. So if Medicare denies payment for something that they think is related and we know it's not, we'll coordinate with Medicare to, to try and get that issue resolved, uh, which again is an ease of use thing for the individual. Um, and at the end of the day, our, our goal is to ensure compliance with CMS rules and regulations. And what we do offer, really does offer a risk transfer if we're administering the file. Um, the risk for handling that file um, is, is squarely on our shoulders and we're responsible for it. Um, and a lot of folks, once they understand what's involved in managing an MSA account, uh, don't wanna do it. And if you can pay less than $1,000 and have someone else do it and never have to negotiate a bill, or coordinate payments, um, most people see the value in that. So, um, all right. And I think this is the last one and then we'll get into some questions. And I know, I think Sharon might have uh, some stuff she wants to talk about as well. Um, CMS's latest work comp MSA reference guide states professional administration is highly recommended. Uh, they said directly in this guide, this was their first time and I think only time endorsing professional administration, they recognize the benefits of it. They said, although beneficiaries may act as their own administrators, it's highly recommended that settlement fund recipients consider the use of a professional administrator for their funds. Um, they also signaled their support for it. Um, we all know there's an opioid e epidemic going on. There's a lot of abuse of medications that can go on. Um, I've had some phone calls with injured parties who you could tell had, had some addiction issues. Uh, there were certain times of the day I couldn't call. Um, when we're working on, on issues or concerns on the case. So Medicare really likes having an administrator involved because it gets another set of eyes uh, on the case and it allows us to kind of look for abuse situations. You know, I have seen situations, we've seen them where uh, somebody's doctor shopping, they're going to four or five different doctors. Now, if that individual is administering their own MSA funds and they're going to all these different doctors and they're using those MSA funds to pay for it, Maybe they're filling prescriptions they shouldn't be filling. Maybe they're overfilling prescriptions. Um, so an administrator is gonna see those bills and look for potential abuse situations. Um, the newest reference guide also adds, CMS highly recommends uh, pro-admin where a claimant is taking controlled substances that CMS determines are frequently abused drugs. Uh, so that's another um, a good, good thing with professional administration. You have an expert looking at it and keeping eyes on it to make sure there's uh, not, uh, not an abuse situation going on. Um, but uh, with that, uh, one of the things I do wanna talk about too um, is, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, MSAs, but there's also the instances where you have a, an individual who is dual eligible, meaning they're on both Medicare and Medicaid. So you're looking at setting up a special needs trust um, on that case. Now, most states, and I said, because Medicaid is, they're, they're all individual, every state's different with it. There's a handful of states that do not count the MSA funds as an asset against the individual. So uh, off the top of my head, um, the ones that I know the most, California, I believe is one, I think South Carolina, potentially, um, I've seen that. And then um, the one that seems to confuse everybody is Connecticut. Connecticut, I think, is really difficult uh, with with some of the stuff they do in terms of um, in terms of trust. Um, but uh, the whole point of me bringing this up is if you have an individual who has a Medicare set aside and they are doing a special needs trust, 
um, it changes how we set things up. We have an agreement for professional administration. Typically on an ordinary case with no Medicaid component, our administration agreement is between us and the individual, the beneficiary of that account. Now, if you have somebody who has an SNT set up, basically what happens is our agreement is not with the individual. Our agreement becomes with the special needs trust. So the special needs trust is in control of that MSA account and oversees it. And by doing that, it takes that individual out of the loop to where they don't have direct control over those MSA funds. So if we set up an MSA account, there's no Medicaid component to it, it's just Medicare. Um, we set it up, we're handling those funds. Technically that individual is in charge of that account. So in that situation, if they were on Medicaid, but the agreement was between MetaVest and the individual, um, in most states, that can that's considered accountable asset, and that can potentially kick them off of their Medicaid benefits because they're earning too much. They have too many assets, right? So uh, when we set up a case where there's a trust involved, um, if we're doing administration, our administration agreement is with the trust, and that takes the individual out of the loop. Therefore, it's not considered accountable asset. So typically, what we see is a trust will be set up, and then the trust will send the MSA funds to MetaVest, we put them in an account for benefit of the individual and we administer them. So we're paying the bills, we're doing all that. Um, so that's really where, when you have a dual eligible individual, you need to be conscious of that. So if they're on Medicare and Medicaid, um, let us know, you know, let us know that, hey, this is the situation because that changes how we need to set things up. Because at the end of the day, and I stress this all the time, um, our job is to protect benefits long-term for these individuals, make sure the burden isn't being shifted to Medicare. Um, unfortunately, uh, if this stuff isn't considered during the settlement process at all, uh, unfortunately, most of the repercussions fall back on the individual post-settlement. And it might not be a year down the road or two years, it might be five years down the road. And some of the parties involved in the settlement may no longer be working. I have an, a guy who ran into an issue on an MSA that wasn't properly administered. He had no idea what he was doing. Um, never addressed during the settlement process. Medicare is denying payments and he went to call his attorney and his attorney has since retired. So he's in a really bad situation and we tried to step in and, and do what we could to get things back on track. But again, you wanna make sure that you at least address these issues. You address the MSA issue. Um, you, you address the lien issue. Um, you want to make that part of your settlement process to make sure all the everything's covered. So uh, I'll kick it over to Sharon. And Sharon, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. And after that, we'll get into some questions. Thanks, Craig. That was great information. Um, you really covered the special needs trust part of that. You know, in Florida, the MSA account, if it's not inside a special needs trust, is counted as an asset. Um, so it is important to, you know, be able to uh, have some professional administration um, as a trustee. That's what we like. And to, you know, have that assistance, you still give a card to the um, individual, the beneficiary to take to the doctor. And then, you know, MetaVest can let the trustee know what needs to be paid, that kind of thing. So it's really helpful. Um, to partner with an organization um, like MetaVest that can do the professional administration. Um, and, and so really that that's you, you pretty much covered that. Um, I know we have some questions in chat. Um, and what, one of my questions, so Craig, is um, a, about the closing part of it. What happens when somebody dies? Um, if yes. you could maybe address that a little bit, and then we'll get into the Q&A. Yeah, so um, when the individual, so the way it's set up is if we're just administering a file, if there's not a Medicaid component to it, um, that individual will designate a beneficiary. So that file has to stay open for a period of time. CMS technically says it, it, it can be up to 18 months. We typically don't have them open that long. Um, so what happens if there's any funds left in there that have been individual in an administration agreement is going to designate a beneficiary. That's primarily what happens. 
So if there's money left over, if we leave that account open for two months just to account for any dates of service prior to that individual passing away, we're still responsible for paying for it. So we need a little time to work through those. But then those funds are released to the beneficiary and there's no restrictions on them. Now, that may change a little bit uh, on, the, um, on the Medicaid side of things. Um, but again, um, it's going to go back. If our agreement is between us and the trust, then it's going to probably divert back to however the trust has it set up. If you know, because I know there may be a payback provision in there for Medicaid, so it's going to fall under. It would potentially fall under that. So, but if it's just professional administration, they designate a beneficiary. Those funds are released. Uh, that's my long fancy way of saying we don't keep the money. So. Um, yeah, in a special needs trust, of course, there's there's Medicaid and 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 maybe Medicare, you know, uh, funds that have to go go back. So, is there a a primary, um, you know, allocation um, calculation or? Um, in terms of, yeah. So, so typically, what happens is once the case settles, uh, once the case settles, because Medicare is aware of that. Um, Typically, there's not you're not going to see a whole lot of liens after the data settlement if that individual is on Medicare when it settles because they're flagging those items in their system and they know that, hey, this isn't related, so we're not paying for it. So that really helps to catch that situation. Um, but uh, again, if Medicare uh, discovers a lien and that data service is prior to us closing out that account, um, then it would be paid out of the MSA funds. If those MSA funds have been released and it comes up, then you can use the MSA funds to pay back that item. You can't pay for any treatment that predates settlement, if that makes sense. So if there is a lien on the file, if we have the file for 10 years, that individual passes away and Medicare has a lien somewhere in that 10 year period, if it's part of the case, then that would, that would need to be paid back. If we are made aware of it, um, then that's something we would take care of. If it's something that comes to light post the funds being dispersed, there's always the potential that could be there. Again, Section 111 reporting, that mandatory reporting really is there to help make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, I'd love to tell you it'll okay. never happen, but I'd be lying if I said it never happens. Um, okay. Let's see. Can uh, you check the chat now and yep. see? Yep, I'm looking right now. There's, um, how do you know if a lien has been placed? It looks like Teresa was asking about this. So um, there's two ways you can do it. Uh, Medivest does do lien investigations. Um, you know, that's uh, kind of like a, an a la carte thing that we do. So if you want assistance with that, another thing that you're able to do is if you're able to sit down with the individual, you can log into the Medicare portal with their credentials and request, basically request um, if, uh, a lien letter, see if there's any liens on the case. So that's one way to do it. Um, as a third party, uh, we do have to jump through some additional hoops to get stuff. We need a little more documentation than if an individual sits down with their attorney and, and requests a, a, a lien. So, um, you know, um, in those situations, again, that's only going to be for Medicare beneficiaries. So there's a couple different options. You know, if you want some assistance with that, you know, let, uh, definitely let Fran know and we can we can help you out with that. Um, one of the things that I want to do, I do want to throw in, and I'm going to try and keep us on time because people get mad when they miss lunch. Um, one of the things I do want to throw in is keep in mind Medicare Advantage plans. These plans that people are getting uh, out there that are like add-ons, you know, they either have a Medicare plan or Medicare Advantage plan. Uh, sometimes people jump around between different plans. Um, when you do a lien investigation with Medicare, they tell you, um, you know, hey, we, we do or we don't have a lien. If that person's on a Medicare Advantage plan, there's no established process or protocols for figuring out if there's a Medicare Advantage plan lien. You have to reach out to that potential lien holder and check. Um, and if that person's switching plans every year, that can become a logistical nightmare. Uh, but it's something you want to consider as you're looking at the case. So ask your client, are you on Medicare benefits or do you have a Medicare Advantage plan? Um, so there's a, an important distinction. Um, See, Deborah said, if you have a client who was on Medicare, was incarcerated and passed away while in prison, went to hospital a couple of times, and you are now the personal representative, CMS was notified under the creditor claims period. Have you ever experienced the claim after the 90-day creditor period? And if so, do you have to reopen the probate? Um, that is a good question because um, it's been closed out and beneficiaries have received their distributions. Um, I... That is a great question and one I haven't had before. So that one is definitely going to go to Nat Reifler, who's our MSP compliance attorney. 
He also handles a lot of lean negotiation and stuff for us. Um, so I am going to, I am going to grab that question. Hang on. I'm going to grab a screenshot of that question and I am going to send that question to Nat. Um, so uh, Deborah, I'm going to make a note here. And uh, Nat is definitely qualified, I think, to answer that question. That is a, that's a good one. Um, all right, so we will get back to you on that one. I want Nat to get some eyes on it because there's a lot of moving pieces to that. Um, how do you calculate life expectancy for the MSA allocation amount? Okay, so uh, typically you have your standard CMS life tables. One of the things with Medicare set-asides is you have comor comorbid conditions. You know, you might have somebody who's a smoker, you might have somebody who's a smoker and diabetic. All those things reduce the life expectancy of the individual. So what we do uh, when we put together a Medicare set-aside is we use what's referred to as a rated age and CMS accepts rated ages. So if you have an individual who's expected, normally would be expected to live for 20 years, and let's say they're 60 and they're expected to live to be 80. Well, maybe they smoke a pack of cigarettes a day. Maybe they're diabetic. Maybe they have some other medical conditions. And instead of being like a 60 year old, they're more like a 70 year old. Their rated age would come back um, at a higher number and you still use the standard life expectancy at the end. So instead of going from 60 to 80, which is 20, you're only allocating for 10 years because that person is more like a 70 year old because of those comorbid conditions. So you're only setting aside 10 years of future medical funding, 10 years of medications versus 20. So when we use the, the life expectancy, we don't just use CMS life tables. Uh, there's one individual, uh, typically a structure broker can get a rated age for you on a case. If you're looking at setting up a structure to fund the Medicare set aside account, uh, it's a cost savings mechanism. Uh, they can put more money in the individual's pocket in certain situations. But if you're looking at funding with a structure, that structure broker will go to the life companies. They'll submit a couple of the medical records and the life companies will come back with what they call their rated age. Uh, if there's no structure involved, there's one individual that I'm aware of. Um, we've been using him forever, um, who is approved by CMS to provide rated ages in instances where there's no structure broker involved. So at the end of the day, um, in the Medicare set aside account, it is an account that has restrictions. And I tell people, you don't wanna put more money in there than you need to. You wanna cover the obligation, but you don't wanna tie up funds unnecessarily. So a rated age is a good way to do that and still stay in compliance. Uh, yeah, some do go on a cruise. <laughs> um, is there a good way to get out of the loop of uh, Medicare denying automatically every time a claim submitted? Uh, then when funds were exhausted, denying even when you send proof repeatedly that the funds are exhausted. Uh, that's something as an administrator, we have to get on the phone with them. Um, it also depends on how it's been reported. Um, that's an interesting thing too. So if that primary payer, the insurance carrier has reported that case and maybe they thought, oh, well, you know, we discussed the shoulder, but it wasn't part of the case. You know, we think it might be, we'll just report it. So you can run into issues where the case hasn't been reported properly by the primary payer. And then Medicare is confused and think that it's related to the case, when in reality, it might not be. So that's a difficult issue to deal with. I sit on a lean committee, uh, and that's one of the things we talk about with CMS and some of the providers is um, getting through that issue. It's a complicated issue. Um, and again, if we're involved from an administration standpoint, um, we can get on the phone with them and work through that. If not, that individual is going to have to work through it and in some instances provide documentation. Um, at the end of the day, I always tell people the best thing to do, whether you do a set aside or not, um, is paper your file. Paper your file, put documentation in there that you address the issues. Uh, Medicare says you need to do what's reasonable. Um, they don't tell you what's reasonable, but you need to do what's reasonable. So the best thing you can do is document your file. Um, Valerie says, if you hire a professional to administer the MSA funds, will they provide accounting statements? Yes. Uh, so uh, the standard practice is we provide annual accounting statements uh, that shows the payments made, um, billed amounts, paid amounts. So they'll see the savings that they're getting by having us involved as an administrator. Um, there's also a tax liability that comes from having that MSA account. It's set up in an interest-bearing account. Um, interest earned on the account stays in the account. Um, but the nice thing that they did, I was kind of surprised they did this, um, we provide the documentation. So if an individual goes to get their taxes done, 
you know, in March, April, whenever it is, um, they go to get those taxes done. If there's any uh, um, interest payments that are due, basically payments for the interest earned on the account, we actually provide those forms uh, to the individual and you can pay the tax liability out of the Medicare set aside for the interest. So if you have an account that's rather large and you made, say it made $200 in interest, if there's a tax liability on it, you can actually use the MSA funds to pay the tax liability. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, does the self-attestation annual letter go to CMS? How does one get a copy of the letter? Um, so I think, I don't know if we have a, I believe we may have a template of that. So what's interesting is on a workers' compensation case, they're aware of the case. Everything's documented in the system. They have a process for it. Um, those self-attestation letters go to Medicare on the comp cases. On liability, um, they don't have a review process for that established. So you want to basically put that self-attestation letter together and just sit it with your file. So if CMS does ever ask for it on a liability case. So like I said, they have a lot more guidelines in comp than they do for liability. Um, so again, it's about kind of papering the file. Um, let's see, I'm going to get, uh, sorry, I'm writing down Valerie's email address real quick. Sure. And Sharon, they were asking if, uh, where could they find the recording? Someone send me a message directly. Oh, oh the recording is going to be on agent's website, trustagent.org. Under okay. our training, we have a training tab at the top um, and all of our prior videos and um, webinars are on that training. Wonderful. Yeah, uh, so Susan says, uh, I'm the court ordered administrator for a client's MSA. Almost all of his providers were very oppositional to do private pay uh, to use the MSA funds and insisted on billing Medicare. Some hospitals refused to send me invoice and would only bill Medicare. None of his providers um, ever heard of an MSA. And that's a common issue. So when we, when we set up an account for an individual, um, uh, one of the things we do is we have a welcome call with that individual and we talk about how to use the account. Um, I did this yesterday. We had a provider, one of our members um, went to a provider they hadn't seen before. The provider was confused. Um, so what we did was I got the information for the provider. Our customer service department reached out to them, explained everything. Um, and like I said, a lot of times when you say, hey, I'm going to be paying you directly and you'll get paid in less than a couple of days, their attitude typically will change. So that's something that... Um, there's a little bit of leverage there um, to get them on board. Uh, they're not having to go through submitting stuff to insurance. Um, so um, if that if that's problematic for you, um, Susan, uh, shoot Fran or I or an, an email. Our information's right up here. Shoot us an email. And what I can do is I could potentially put you in touch with our director of claims. And uh, he could probably give you some tips on how to assist in that situation. Um, but yeah, we do see that. Um, where uh, providers are not wanting to bill us, but a lot of times they're concerned that um, since there's no insurance involved, they're concerned about getting paid. And the reality of it is once we speak with them, they realize they're gonna get paid very quickly and at a reasonable rate. So um, can you all please verify your contact info because the phone numbers are, oh, gotcha. Um, let me see. Uh, what happens if the account is not being used anymore? Example, a uh, person had a back injury and now medical need. So that's un unfortunately in that situation, CMS does not allow you to take the MSA funds out of the account and use them as you see fit. Uh, back when I started, um, about a year before I started in MSP compliance, so 2004, uh, Medicare used to let you, uh, if you had additional medical records that said you needed no more treatment, um, Medicare would allow you to apply for a one-time disbursement from the MSA. And then they found out everybody was doing that. People would get doctor's reports and say, hey, I'm fine now. And then six months later, they're back at the doctor getting treated for the same thing, but they've taken money out of their MSA. So CMS put the kibosh on that. That one's, that one's gone. So the MSA funds have to stay in the account to be used for um, Medicare covered case related items. You can't take it out of there. Now, if you have somebody who's self-administering and there's nobody standing on their shoulder to make sure they're following the rules, they're going to do what they want with it. Um, but they have to be aware that if they misuse the funds, Medicare could step in and deny payments for it and force them to put back the money that they used. Um, let's see. When the medical, Medicare portion of the MSA is exhausted, can I use the prescription portion to cover um, 
ongoing medica medical expenses, should I be having Medicare covered medical care? Um, use a prescription portion. Uh, yes, so this MSA fund, um, like I said, it's a snapshot in time. So if we allocate 50,000 for future medical and 40,000 for medications, and you never go to the, the treater, but you spend all of that money on medications, that's fine. It's Medicare covered and, and, and a case allowable expenses. It is not set in stone. It is a snapshot in time. So that total amount is what needs to be spent. It doesn't matter if you end up spending all of it because we have some individuals who are taking a lot of medications, they settle their case and lo and behold, they decide they don't want to take medications anymore and they just get treatment. So yeah, as long as those funds are there, they can be used for any Medicare covered case related. It doesn't have to be one or the other. And it doesn't have to be that set amount. It's just the total fund needs to pay for future medical and prescriptions. So um, let's see. Um, yeah, and, and I tell people a lot, I'm looking at the comments here. Um, once you get your hands around this a little bit, Fran and I are here to help. Uh, Fran's the director of sales, so she's probably going to be the best contact. Uh, reach out to Fran and we'll walk you through this. It doesn't cost anything to call us up and have a call. Um, if you're in a situation where you understand it and your client is still unclear, we're happy to hop on. We call them case consults with individuals. There's no cost for that. We'll walk you through this. I'm a no pressure kind of person. Uh, my job at the end of the day is to lay out the guidelines and, and the rules and the statute and let you know um, what the options are so you can make an informed decision on how you want to proceed. Uh, we're not going to push in anything that's unnecessary. Um, the last thing I want to do is have somebody set aside MSA funds when it's not necessary. Uh, we really don't want to put anybody in that situation. Um, you know, um, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, Fran and I can help you. Just let us know if you have any questions. We're happy to um, we're happy to uh, to go through those. And I will tell you, I've I've got a case consult. Fran and I have one later today. Um, it's a liability claim, and there's three separate accidents. And the individual had pre-existing conditions. So there's a lot to unpack in that call. It's it's going to be a good call. And uh, there's no cost associated with it. We're just going to work through it and, and provide a recommendation on how to proceed. And with some of this, uh, it's an assumption of risk. How comfortable are you doing what you're doing on the case? Uh, if you have somebody who needs extremely minimal treatment and you, know, you, you do simple math on it and say, okay, they, have, they just go once a year to the doctor. They're not on any meds. You know, if you designated an amount for that and say, okay, this is going to be three grand over the next such and such years, you can do that. You know, obviously, as the case gets more complicated, you want to be more cautious on how you do it. You want to look into things in a little more detail. But um, the worst thing you can do is completely ignore this issue because it will impact their benefits down the road. So um, with that, um, I'm, uh, I'm a little over my apologies. Um, but uh, yeah, so thank you. I want to say thank you to everyone for uh, letting us present today. Let us know if you have any questions. I don't know, Fran, you have anything you want to add? No, thank you, Greg. That was very, very informative. I see the comments. Everybody was super happy with the presentation. And thank you, Sharon, for, for having us today. Um, so yeah, I'll give it back to you, Sharon. Well, thank you very much for presenting for us. Great comments, and it was really good information. So thank you very much. Sorry we went over, everybody. But feel free to, um, you know, reach out to Fran or Craig or myself, and we can try to help you through whatever you need. Uh, we're going to take a little break on our monthly webinars, so be uh, stay tuned for more information. I know we ha have an actual Medicare uh, webinar in September and um, some more good things. We're going to take a little break during the summertime. So we will see you all again soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Have, have a great rest of the week. Take care.